It's Tuesday and it's 1 p.m. Eastern. Welcome to Advancement Live. Advancement Live is part of the Higher Ed Live Network, a series of professional development web shows and podcasts which are always free and accessible to you in our archives at higheredlive.com and on iTunes. Be part of our broadcast by tuning in live and sharing your insights and questions using the Higher Ed Live hashtag on Twitter. You can receive weekly updates with live show dates and times by subscribing to the Higher Ed Live newsletter. I'm your host for today's show, Andrew Gosen, and today we are going to have some fun. We'll be discussing the New York Times digital innovation report that came out back in the spring and using it to think about what a digital first advancement operation might look like. And as you'll see shortly, today's three guests are perfect for this conversation. But before we dive in, I want to give a shout out to our Advancement Live sponsors, iModules and M. Stoner. iModules software is the leading constituent engagement management provider for educational institutions. iModules delivers an integrated online platform that transforms how institutions strengthen constituent relationships and achieve fundraising success. iModules, thank you for your support. We couldn't do this without you. Higher Ed Live is produced by M. Stoner, a marketing and communications firm that works with educational institutions on branding, strategy, web design, and more. In September, that being this month, happy beginning of the semester, M. Stoner is hosting a complimentary webinar focused on optimizing your design eye. No Photoshop experience is required. We are tweeting out a link right now where you can learn more and register. And now, let me set the stage for today's show. Back in March, a digital innovation report was commissioned by the New York Times, and it began making the rounds online. It was an internal study that was intended to help the New York Times evolve to compete more effectively in the digital space with other established papers that are making heavy investments in digital, such as the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post as well as wildly popular online news organizations such as Vox and the Huffington Post. But as people read through it, it became very clear that its analysis of digital and its recommendations for organizations struggling to retain relevance in, in the current digital age actually had relevance that went far beyond the confines of journalism or the New York Times itself. In fact, the report's authors had produced an astute and incredibly readable analysis of the challenges and opportunities that are faced by many established and high-performing organizations um, that are struggling to cope with the pace and the feel and the fluidity of the digital economy. And today we're going to use some of the topics highlighted in the report and some of the recommendations to think through what advancement might look like and feel like if it were to pivot to a digital first footing. So let me start by introducing today's guests, and we're going to kick things off by just asking them for some initial thoughts and reflections about the report. Today's first guest hails from Palo Alto, California. Um, Adam Miller is Director of Digital and Data Services at the Stanford Alumni Association. He likes finding insights in data and building great digital experiences. In 2005, he developed the Relationship Model, a new way to segment Stanford's alumni, beha alumni by behavior, and in 2009, he began to lead the SAA's social media strategy. Since 2012, he has led the Merge Digital and Data Services Department, which combines data, social, web, email, mobile, and other digital efforts in one vision under, in, sorry, <laughs> under one vision in strong partnership with uh, programs across the SAA. Adam graduated from Stanford in 1999 with a double major in music and human biology, and he has been a member of Stanford staff since 2002. Adam, welcome to the show, and thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. So in terms of your initial thoughts as you, as you read through the Digital Innovation Report, what, what jumped out at you as worthy of comment? Sure. I mean, one of the first things that jumped out was how courageous it was for the organization to take a look so holistically and uh, look across departments, look for what isn't working as much as what is working. So I thought that was a great model. So I think I, I love that you, uh, you've been inspired to kind of bring this into our world as, as a way to just, at the highest level, start thinking about what we are, who we are, and, and where we're going. And then you won't be surprised to hear this from me. Um, the data was, was probably most interesting, and just the, the approach with data, how to, how to maximize your data, how to add metadata, how to really think about the assets you have and make the most out of them. A lot of times when we do you know, move into worlds of, of unknown and unsure waters, 
we're not sort of sure, you know, we might jump for the shiniest object, um, but really there's a lot that we have and a lot of strengths that we have. And frankly, in our world in advancement, a lot of that goes into the data that we have. If we were a startup, you know, we wouldn't have that about our consumer base. We have a lot already in place, so there's a lot that we can do with that. So it feels like some of, a very actionable next step with this is to really look at your data, think about how you can expand that, leverage what you already have, and then sort of get a lot better at targeting to lead to an ultimate goal of relevance to your, your constituent base. What I really like about what you just shared was your emphasis on the fact that there actually are a whole host of things that we have going for us right now that we already have, mm -hmm. that we don't have to create. I thought one of the, the most interesting challenges that they set themselves as they drafted up this report was simultaneously positioning themselves to thrive and compete in the digital space while at the same time not letting go the core beliefs and the core products that have been so essential to their success over time. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting balancing act. Um, right. Staying true to what's put you in this position of leadership to start with while at the same time remaking yourselves in such a way that that you can continue to thrive in the future. Right, and, and ideally you find that digital version of your secret sauce so you don't lose it altogether. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you so much Adam. Um, let's now turn to our next guest. We're moving from the West Coast to the East Coast. And next up is Harmony Farrow. Harmony Farrow is Director of Annual Giving Programs at Texas Christian University. She has worked in higher education advancement for the past seven years previously serving as Director of Student and Young Alumni Programs at TCU and as a Donor Relations Officer at Cornell University. Harmony has conducted several studies on the impact of social media on alumni relations and is the lead author of Building Stronger Ties with Alumni Through Facebook to Increase Volunteerism and Charitable Giving, which was published in the Journal of Computer Mediated Communication in April of 2011. She is a regular presenter with Academic Impressions, speaking about student and young alumni engagement and philanthropy, volunteer management, gaining institutional buy-in, and maximizing budgets. She has just returned to the U.S. from presenting on the use of social media as a fundraising tool at the Educate Plus Biennial Conference in Melbourne, Australia. Harmony earned her bachelor's degree from Ithaca College and her master's degree in communication from Cornell University. Harmony, uh, welcome back to the U.S. and welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. So, same question as I posed Adam. What were your initial takeaways from reading through the Digital Innovation Report? Well, Adam took it right away from me. Uh, I think the the courage that it took to, uh, to put something like this together, I think um, universities and higher education in general share a lot in common with the New York Times in terms of uh, having very long storied histories. Uh, and we do a lot of things well, and we tend to have done them well for a long time. Um, and we have tended to have done them the same way for a long time. And so looking at this really big cultural shift moving forward, um, especially as our students and our younger alumni are uh, very engaged in the digital and social spaces and how we really look to do a better job of connecting with them, um, I thought that in particular their uh, discussion of audience development and breaking that down into sort of the, the three subcategories of discovery, promotion, and connection are very analogous to what we tend to look at in advancement in terms of alumni engagement and participation. So I think there are quite a few things that can be taken from this report and, um, and utilized by us in our field. And as I was reading that same section about the audience development, it was occurring to me that that maps almost perfectly to the whole idea of pipeline in a fundraising context. Absolutely. And, and the interesting thing there was their, their realization that they still have this amazing product, but if they can't get it in front of the right readers, the quality of that product doesn't matter. And I feel like we're in an analogous position in terms of development and that we have these great opportunities to act in a philanthropic way that actually make a substantive difference both in the lives of students and faculty and then also in the broader world. But if we can't get those opportunities in front of the right people in the pipeline, it doesn't make any difference. Exactly. That's why I'm so excited to be a part of the discussion today. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. That was a, that was a great opening salvo there. Let's now move on to our third guest, Mayan Plout. Um, Mayan hails from Oberlin College in Ohio. Um, she is the manager of social strategy and 
projects at her alma mater, Oberlin College, and she manages Oberlin social spaces and projects there, as her title suggests. Uh, she serves as a cheerleader, consultant, and strategist for anyone interested in exploring social media on campus. Mayan has presented at Hi Ed Web, the Web Conference at Penn State, the Case Social Media and Community Conference, Confab Higher Ed, Academic Impressions, and is a frequent guest on the Higher Ed Live Network. In her free time, Mayan writes a lot, tweets a lot, and thinks about food a lot. And Mayan, welcome to the show. Hi. I'm really, really happy to be here. And as my bio said, I do a lot of things. And this is something that I really love to do, is talk with smart people about smart things. Fantastic. Uh, you're with the right group. And we hope that the, uh, the Wi-Fi truck that just pulled mm -hmm. up in your driveway is going to... Nothing to do with me. With I didn't call well them. About. We'll see what's happening. All right. So, <laughs> so let's start off with the same question um, that, that Adam and Harmony answered. What were your initial thoughts as you read through the, the Digital Innovation Report? So unlike the other three folks on the show today, I am not um, strictly in the advancement office, though they are one of the folks that I partner with a ton to talk strategy. Um, so I was reading this from a slightly different lens from a more general communication standpoint. And I think um, a lot of those lessons obviously are going to apply to advancement in particular. And it was both incredibly reassuring to know that an organization as long-standing as um, the New York Times is thinking forward, but also recognizing its own flaws. Um, both the New York Times and our fine institutions kind of have an embarrassment of riches most of the time, that we're doing so much great stuff and we haven't fully figured out what we're supposed to do with it. I think the first thing that I wrote down while taking notes was, we make a lot of great things and we really suck at telling people about them. That definitely holds true. Um, but the, the three like big takeaway things that I was um, kind of pulling out during my initial uh, read for the show was that... Um, Thinking about strategy is not necessarily a focus on creating new stuff, but to get more out of what we're doing, um, which followed up really nicely with the line that's going to stick with me forever is that legacy content is that gift that we'll always keep on giving really appropriate for advancement, but also just in general when we're thinking about um, our lean teams within higher ed and how we do more with less, um, knowing that we also have tons and tons of stuff in our background that can really help us as we move forward. Our history is something that we can't take away from our institution, and that should be factoring in for good or bad as we move forward. And then the last thing that, from a social media manager perspective, was really, really valuable, and I'm glad it was emphasized a lot in the report, is that our audiences are our most underutilized resource. This is a, has a very direct tie to advancement, because that is both a resource in terms of people, but also in terms of relationships, and the future of the school really does lay in the hands of the people that we're connecting with, hopefully through advancement and all these other means within the university. Mayan, thank you. That was I, I appreciate your, your calling out the fact that you're viewing this from a slightly more communications, pure communications perspective than, mm -hmm. than the rest of us. Um, I am tweeting out uh, shortly, it's scheduled to be tweeted out, a blog posting by Andrew Cariega at Missouri Science and Technology. Um, he wrote a an analysis of the digital innovation report that also dealt with this from a pure communications perspective right after it was released. Yeah. Uh, he's usually right there ahead of the curve and seeing interesting opportunities. Um, so that's a resource that's out there as well. And I've also, uh, for our viewers, I have tweeted out a link to a place where you can actually download the entire report should this conversation provoke you to go ahead and, and tackle it yourself. So hearing the three of you talk, it, it feels to me like one of the areas that we, we ought to address right up front is the, the urgency of the need for advancement to think about shifting to a digital first footing. Um, as, as you've all made clear in, in different ways, higher ed has done this very well for a really long time and that's a large part of the reason why people like Harmony are being invited to fly all over the world to share thoughts on how we do advancement in the US with um, with some of our international colleagues. Um, but it's pretty clear reading the, the New York Times report that they, they took the step of commissioning this report. They had the courage to do this because they perceived this to be a matter of survival. Um, their core product is quality journalism, and they had a sense that they were losing their audience in the face of competition that was doing a better job of 
reaching readers where they were in the ways that they wanted to be reached. Um, in some cases, the report actually details ways in which BuzzFeed would actually take content from a recent New York Times story and repackage it and push it out to the BuzzFeed audience and end up with numbers that were substantially better than those the Times itself was getting on its own digital properties. And that's, uh, that's a real problem for a business that's dependent on, on getting its content in the hands of readers. So my first question is, to what extent do you think that advancement is actually suffering from these same sorts of competitive pressures? Um, is this a matter of survival yet? And if not, what sorts of what sorts of things do you think would need to happen to make it seem um, as urgent as it did to the New York Times? Uh, Adam, how would you like to tackle that one first? Sure, definitely. It's such an interesting question. You know, I remember in the earliest days of social media, as you all do, um, there was a lot of worry that you know, is Facebook going to kill the alumni association? Is that going to completely disrupt um, advancement? Is it going to eliminate the need for reunions? Right. Um, and I think what we've seen from that is, is it's definitely been the opposite. It's been something that has created demand in our world. <laughs> it actually brings a lot more to us. So I think um, my, my quick thought would be I think it's going to be missed opportunities in a lot of ways. Um, but I do think over the longer time scale, it does become a threat, um, especially in our because our time scales are so long in, in it's institutions like ours. We need to start investing in the future now. What can happen is if we don't start that investment process now, we can get to a point where we're definitely left flat-footed, either where we're not able to respond to the evolution of our actual constituent base, and so we find ourselves in looking at each other and, and not seeing you know, the same simpatico that we used to, or, um, or just not being ready to take advantage of some of the key opportunities that suddenly would be a game-changer in alumni relations. I mean, just look at Facebook for us right now, today. We have hundreds to thousands of daily touches with alumni, right? That's very different from, you know, they augmented each other, um, what we do with reunions every five years. They're different things, but um, it's just a profound new area of alumni relations. Um, so I would hate to have missed that, right? Mm -hmm. I think we would be fine moving forward with reunions. It would, it would be great. It's going to be great for a long, long time, but it's sort of this other key component that I would hate for us to miss. And so I'm thinking of what is that, and this report really outlines, in a way, a framework for thinking about what might be that next component that you don't want to miss out on and how to take advantage of it at times. So Adam, you're a data guy. What sorts of data would you be looking at to uh, begin to get a sense that, that you're missing out on something you don't want to miss out on? Yeah, you know what, we, we try to look at it, as you know, we look at alumni by behavior. And my latest thinking has been that we want to look at our alumni by sort of three dimensions together, right? One of those is behavior, one of those is interests, and one of those is attributes or demographics, right? And it isn't until you really combine those three that you have something really actionable, and certainly for the people you know well, but really uncovering the people you don't know as well. So when you look at your constituent base, sort of being able to map those three things and finding those interesting subsegments, that's where I think the future is. So really starting from that data, and then developing campaigns, communication strategies, programs, products out of that. And then you're holistically engaging your whole population, ideally, in the way that they want to be engaged with you. Um, particularly interesting, too, has been we actually have a lot of behavioral data, which is wonderful. We have a lot of the attribute data, much better than outside industry, certainly. But interest data is always tricky. You know, are people filling in forms every five years when they come to reunion? Are they filling out their alumni profiles online? Hopefully, yes. But it's not the real-time dynamic interest that you find through social, right? Or through uh, reaction to digital content, like you saw outlined in the report, right? So the more we can capture and map that, the more I think we can get really, really nimble at being able to serve up these dynamic experiences. And that could be capitalizing on current events, something that's just suddenly on alumni minds that they want to discuss and talk about, or on major platform changes at the other end of the spectrum. Great. Let's move on to Harmony. Harmony, what's your sense of the, the urgency of this need to undertake this sort of, of radical self-evaluation? Well, I am viewing it through the lens of annual giving. And one of the things that we are hearing sort of across the industry from institutions year over year is um, <clears throat> dollars are up and donors are down. 
And I think that that really speaks to what Mayan was saying, that we have a really fantastic product, if you will, in higher education, but we are not reaching the people that we need to be reaching the way we need to be reaching them. Um, <clears throat> at TCU, 29% of our um, alumni, our living alumni, graduated within the last 10 years. And so like a lot of institutions, we have a growing a younger potential donor pool that we are working with. According to the 2013 Millennial Impact Report, 84% um, of millennials made some sort of charitable contribution in 2012. And yet we know that they're not really giving to higher education. So I think, again, that speaks to the fact that we might have a really fantastic product that is worth um, investing in and giving to, but we are not getting our uh, case for support out to these young individuals in the channels that they are looking for information. So I think if we're not already there at that urgent moment, we are very close. Couldn't agree with you more, and your mention of the Millennial Impact Report makes me laugh because Look what's right here in my desk Aww. next to it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's next up for reading and, and careful note-taking. Mayan, how about you? Um, in a way, the fact that you do sit in a communications role means that your perspective may, may map the most closely to the New York Times perspective on urgency here. Yeah, so actually the, the nugget that I took out of the report is something that I think is applicable to all of us, which is... Um, so th there's a single, like, I think it's just in a graphic, um, a small mention of um, the reason why the New York Times should be looking at mobile is that even though they don't have a ton of mobile data for themselves, they know the mobile data of how people are interacting with social media, which is a key place where their audience is, whether they're consuming New York Times content there or not. And for us, that's actually something that we've been thinking about communications-wise is we need to know what our audience is using in order to be ready for our audience's development. So communications dealing with all the different audiences around campus, hopefully our prospective students will one day turn into donors. Like there's a couple years there, but um, if we don't understand how they're communicating with each other and what sorts of tools they're using themselves, we're gonna be very far behind without even knowing what happened, simply because we don't know how people are speaking to each other. It doesn't mean that we need to speak to each other the way that people speak, speak on Snapchat, but we need to be aware that there's at least the piece of our audience's brains that are attuned to what's happening outside of what's happening in our, in our schools. Um, and it's great that the New York Times kind of like briefly reflected upon that, but I almost even wanted more. So I guess the, the takeaway with, with this is I see crowdfunding and higher ed being a very, very logical reaction to seeing crowdfunding succeed elsewhere um, with all of the additional added benefits of giving transparency to where money goes, allowing microphilanthropy, all these other little pieces as well. Um, higher ed crowdfunding doesn't really look like non-higher ed crowdfunding in implementation necessarily, but it's taking a lot of the same strategies that are being used by our audiences simply because they understand the platform that we are then integrating into the way that we think as well. Thanks. I totally agree, and I, I think that point that you made about needing to know what your people are doing, period, regardless of whether or not that reflects how they're interacting with you. If they aren't interacting with you, that doesn't mean they're not there. They're still there. You're just yeah. not looking for them in the right places, and it, it seems pretty clear to me that one aspect of being a digital first advancement operation would be making a much more serious investment in basic behavioral market research of that ilk than we, we currently do. We tend to view that as sort of a, a, an optional add-on, and it feels to me like that's actually pretty fundamental to knowing uh, where we can most strategically invest our efforts. Yeah, absolutely. So let's turn to the issue of platform. Uh, one of the elements at the core of the New York Times' competitive disadvantage relative to some of their more forward-thinking legacy paper peers and some of the new digital-only um, news operations uh, seems to be that their platform simply is not as powerful or as customized or as tailored for the digital space. 
Um, on one hand, they've done some incredible things with uh, digital, including using interactive graphics to enable readers to engage with particular stories. Um, but according to the report, the majority of those efforts seem to be one-off solutions that consume a lot of time and that really don't scale very well at all. And on the flip side of the coin, there's extensive commentary from BuzzFeed CEO in the report, um, who very directly attributes BuzzFeed's success to the huge investment that they made in building out their platform. Um, it's a platform that not only uh, works directly with the things like listicles that are clearly so compelling to readers, um, but it's something that also scales incredibly well. It's evidently quite easy to use, and now they're discovering that having this platform in place gives BuzzFeed a competitive advantage in terms of attracting digital journalism talent relevant to some of the less well-equipped um, people who are working in that space. Um, so what sorts of features would we find on a, on a platform that would uh, form the foundation for a digital-first advancement operation? And Adam, I think you're, you're first up to bat with that question. I would love to be first up to bat with that question. Um, that, is, that is right up in my alley there. Um, very exciting, as we're, we're actually thinking through a lot of these questions right now at Stanford um, for both the Development Office and the Alumni Association as we you know, wholesale platform change. But first of all, I'll just say these questions are difficult. You know, you, you think about wanting to be innovative and wanting to be nimble, but then you also have your IT operation to be able to support that. So, you know, there's a tension between how much, you know, what sort of enterprise level tool would support and someone you can call and yell at and all that good stuff to balance against, um, you know, at an organization level, especially a larger organization, um, some of these, these you know, very late breaking kind of tools and tactics. So I think what it comes down to, in my opinion at least, is, um, is layers. You really think about separating the layers of your platform. So think about having the fundamental data platform being flexible and having APIs built upon it, such that you know you can communicate with the other layers of your existing platform without everything being directly tied together. But you also use that as a little bit of insurance over time to be able to develop quickly. Let's just say you have a brand new kind of app that you want to develop or a brand new platform that makes content publishing really easy and you want to just be able to share data there, um, say an inbound API, outbound API to that platform, mm -hmm. that you can do that quickly and easily. It's actually something that helped LinkedIn when they sort of got hit by a mobile crunch. It was actually their API that enabled um, them to have the mobile version of LinkedIn because their enterprise platform like ours wasn't so flexible to allow that. So that's one thing. Other layers are separating your content from your presentation. So we need a content management platform, but don't get too crazy about that locking in your user experience either. So there are different tasks to sort of store and index and put all that good metadata on that content, but it's different than don't stop there and just have a template you take off the internet and throw that on, you know, one theme. <laughs> that, that is your user experience. Um, that's going to limit you in a lot of ways um, on the mobile front, the device front, like the other folks here have mentioned. So um, think about ways to make that thin presentation layer really, really flexible and tap into some of the newest innovation there on the web. Um, check out Virgin America's new website if you want to see a little bit of that um, really cool user experience that they're doing, um, brand new. Uh, so, so think of those layers and make sure that one layer isn't, um, and this is very common in organizations, one layer isn't sort of taking over another layer and making it all, sort of gluing it down and making it less flexible based on you know, what it has to do. So, and as the New York Times in their report said, go open source, go with things that are well documented, there's large developer communities because it means you don't have to do it all yourself, and you can take advantage of the innovation that's happening in the outside communities and just jump onto it and do a little customization of that. One of the lines that really stuck out from the report for me was when one of them said, build out of Legos, not out of bricks. Right. And that was recognizing the fact that even if we come up with the perfect solution for September 2014, what we need in January 2015 may be substantially different. And you just don't want to ever lock yourself down into something that's not going to be able to evolve. Um, Maya, let's, let's turn to you now. What's your take on this? It just feels like a mess. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I guess I've been I've been thinking about this a lot because we're we we are always talking about how our different CMSs, even within the office of communications, speak to each other or not. And it's I felt so much of that in the report. 
um, when it comes to we are doing quick fixes on individual things, but we also really want to experiment, but our experiment's going to be something that is sustainable. Um, I don't have anything intelligent to say about this beyond I really feel their pain, and even within a communications office, experimenting small scale, utilizing social media like it was encouraged in the report, um, so much of that like data collection even is still completely manual. Um, it's drawing the lines between a Facebook post, the link that was shared, the fact that it went on Tumblr, the fact that it's on this website but it also had a link to another website and that all comes from Google Analytics but in order to know if it worked within a specific platform we had to check the analytics of the specific platform. So I think it's more just how do things speak to each other and is it going to be possible to connect all of the dots? Um, other, other than that I feel it feels very messy. Harmony, how about you? From a from an annual fund perspective, what sorts of features mm -hmm. could you imagine a, a platform providing that would address some of your major pain points? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think because we deal so much with mass communication, um, accuracy within our constituent management systems is so critical. Um, and so that sort of really gets to a lot about what Mayan was just saying, where that compatibility has to be there. You want your platforms to be very uh, user friendly, uh, you want their interfaces to be interesting, and you want to have flexibility to be creative and move, move forward and change with the times, building more out of Legos than bricks per se. Um, but from an annual giving perspective, we really need that compatibility back to our constituent management system so that we're actually able to capture that data, capture it accurately so that it's then usable for a multi-channel approach. Couldn't agree more. It, it feels frustrating to me that, that there are individual best-of-breed solutions that actually address many of our needs beautifully, but the trick is getting them all to talk to each other in a way that helps us get sort of a force multiplier going on in which we can we can pick and choose which tools we need to we need to deploy to achieve whatever advancement goal that we're working on um, and I know I'm not certainly not the first person to observe that and it has to be a pretty tough nut to crack because otherwise we would have seen some sort of solution out there um, but Adam I suspect we're all going to be keeping an eye on what you all are doing to <laughs> see if you can figure this out and then we can we can uh, take inspiration from that, as we so often do. Okay, no pressure. <laughs> Let's turn now from technical considerations to organizational uh, considerations. So the report takes a hatchet to the silos that pervade the New York Times organization, especially the vast cultural, social, and status gap between the newsroom and the business side of the paper. Um, the recommendations conclude that in today's digital world, the newsroom and the business side staff really need to work together to focus on the reader experience. Uh, without a competitive reader experience, the content's not going to be read, ad sales are going to be difficult, and so on. And so it turns out that all of the metrics that used to be treated as discrete bottom lines suddenly seem to be very strongly interrelated and dependent on each other for survival. Um, so what are your thoughts about, about this whole issue of silos and how the existing silos, we talk about, about silos all the time. In fact, at the, the Case Social Media and Community Conference this past spring, uh, we quickly began talking about that as the silo busting conference because the silos were really uh, bashed just about every opportunity that we had to bash them. How do you see this whole, this whole need to work across these existing organizational boundaries playing out to make a digital first advancement strategy possible? Let's kick off with Harmony this time, please. Yeah, and you know what, I, I, silos grew out of necessity, I think, um, you know, as, as organizations tend to get larger and um, departments become more specialized, they do have their own goals, and I don't think that that is necessarily an issue, so I, I do think that we need to say that before starting in on this conversation, um, but I think that it is not just necessarily a digital first issue that we're looking at in terms of uh, necessarily busting down the silos. Um, 
but it becomes a challenge, and uh, this is a really interesting point, I think, as we look at how integrated our metrics are and the need for collaboration across various departments, especially in higher education. Um, when you look at how alumni relations plays into annual giving, which feeds into the pipeline of major gifts, and everything is really interconnected. If you don't have strong research and donor relations, none of this is going to come together. Um, but then you're challenged with everybody being so busy that you can't have uh, meetings all the time, right? We're, we're always uh, begrudging those uh, half day long all staff meetings that we all have to attend and, and that becomes a challenge too. So um, I think it's interesting to think about how we break down some of these silos that have grown sort of naturally um, but can become barriers to certain aspects of what we need to do. Um, and I think when we look at digital first, I think one of the biggest challenges, and, and maybe Mayan can talk a little bit more about this from a central communication perspective, um, but if you go out onto Facebook and you just search TCU, you'll come up with over 500 different groups posting different messages about different things. And um, so I think sometimes thinking about digital first, but then also keeping uh, a strategic message behind it that's, that's sort of um, keeping a singular face on everything is, is an interesting challenge. Mayan, what's your, what's your take on that? Oh man, I'm so glad you just mentioned the, what happens when you search for a school's name on Facebook and what you get. Um, that's how audience feels all the time. Like it's not, like we're seeing this as an internal thing, but it's also very much an external thing as well in terms of how things get perceived by the people that we're trying to reach. Um, I think just, I'm going to back up and speak like about internal, internal silos and how it's very interesting. My job shifted from being solely a web thing to I now report to the director of media relations but work with the web team and the creative team because my job is kind of a happy merging of all of those things. Um, so with that in mind, like it's even within an office, knowing what everyone is doing and how that work connects to each other takes time and energy. And again, you can't sit down and have meetings with your whole office or even parts of your office every single day. Um, when it comes to the busting part of it, I, I think a lot of that it was also mentioned in the report, which made me very happy, was thinking about how, I hope I'm not usurping the hiring question that we're going to tackle in a moment, um, that hiring across lines is actually very smart. It doesn't solve the silo problem because inevitably someone has to report to a division or a department or a entire office. Um, but having either dual reports or dual kind of living in multiple places at the same time has really helped, at least at Oberlin, to start kind of integrating social communications into more things that we're doing. There's at least an awareness that it needs to be connected. Um, there isn't necessarily always all going to be followed through in all of it, but there is an acknowledgement that communications is going to be a part, like the communications office will be a part of new people who are coming in to help do digital communications or alumni engagement or, uh, I mean, even just like extrapolating forward digital office or giving officers. It really, it expands out of the merging of two silos in terms of expertise but also need. Um, and kind of being able to sit in multiple worlds and seeing how that affects and can benefit from each thing. That was another thing in the report that actually was really reassuring to read is that there's, while we are seeing very clear, distinct lines from the internal part of our organization, the outside world doesn't see it and all they see is our name. And they are, hopefully, when thinking about the pipeline, the pipeline doesn't begin with being a donor moving on to major gift. It really does start with the prospective student turning into a student feeling good enough that they actually maybe potentially want to go back to the university. And that pipeline, communications-wise, I'm, I'm not seeing someone who can holistically do all of that. I'm seeing it as a team of people who kind of very smoothly hand off audiences and everything we know about them from place to place, which, going back to platforms, I don't know how we're going to do because everything isn't connected yet. Thank you. Adam, I'm really curious to hear your response to this particular question since it feels to me like your work unit actually has directly addressed um, a lot of what Mayan was just describing in terms of the need to get the right people, people 
working together on a daily basis in such a way that you produce a better end user experience. Uh, how does this look from your seat? Yeah, absolutely. So you're exactly right. Um, our digital and data services team really merged a lot of these digital functions together, which has been a very interesting experiment. We're about two and a half years into that. And um, certainly it's great just to have everybody here collaborating together. But some of the most interesting pieces of this have been at the intersections of social and data, or data and web, or web and um, social. So you know, all those pieces together, um, just sitting together and working on projects together can be interesting. Um, definitely what resonates is what uh, Harmony and Mayan said about um, the time it takes. So how do you lift out of the very busy you know, daily schedule that you have? And we have a lot of meetings already, so it's not like we want to add more meetings to that. But one thing that's been a little bit of an inspiration for us is there's a book called Creative Confidence. Tom Kelly, David Kelly, they talked about, I may have this wrong, but I think it was Intuit that launched a sort of innovation catalyst um, strategy as part of their way to stay fresh and get back to their more innovative roots. But trying to identify people within your organization and sort of have that natural, innovative sort of flair to them, and then sort of enlisting them in some of these creative projects that are that are silo busting projects, and they will spread the word within their own divisions. But then they also unite as a team that can kind of move some of this innovation ahead. And if it isn't a full time position, let's say ten percent of their time, so they're not getting pulled totally out of their main position, right? So that's a little easier pill to swallow for the manager saying, no, don't take my great person away from me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a little piece of that person. They get sort of a collaborative team that they can work on. So I really like this idea of sort of these lean, very time-based um, lean product teams maybe that can kind of emerge. We've actually experimented a bit with that here as well. So in addition to our digital data services structure, sort of, sort of helping form and steward these innovation teams particularly on the mobile front, um, which has been successful. It's been fun for the people that are part of it. We've, we've had broad participation from departments. We were part of it. We had a lot of fun with it. It generates data and um, just gives us sort of this steady innovation pipeline. So we, we as an organization have an outlet for some of these cre you know, this creativity and these ideas that can come from anywhere within the organization. So just sort of, it, it's that, sort of that R&D arm, <laughs> you know, or it's that test kitchen of your organization to always kind of keep cooking. So it's been, it's been successful. The back channel is also pointing out that APIs can break silos. So perhaps yeah. the right platform um, can also help us work across business units in ways that we're not, we're not accustomed to. Uh, thank you for that tweet, Steve Rittler. Yeah. All right, so we, uh, we seem to be drilling down, we're, we're focusing hard here on, on the issues of staffing and personnel, so um, we're at the, the heartbreaking moment in every show when I realize I'm not going to get through all of my questions. So I'm going to start doing some triage here and focus on this issue of the right people and how do the right people work together in such a way to have the maximum impact on the organization. So first let's talk about, about staffing in its most literal sense. Um, the Digital Innovation Report concludes that the New York Times' print-first biases have actually colored their hiring decisions in a way that makes a pivot to digital first difficult. Um, specifically, they tend to place too much of a premium on journalism experience when they're hiring people for digital positions, and they don't place enough of a premium on digital skills when they're hiring for pure journalism positions. Um, what do you all think about this? In a digital first advancement operation, could you imagine screening for certain digital skills in a way that's similar to the way that we currently ask people if they're proficient on Microsoft Office, for instance? Uh, Harmony, let's start with you on that one. Yeah, I think if we are thinking in terms of what digital first advancement would look like, that would become a requirement, right? I mean, we would really need to make sure that people had at least basic skills that we could then continue to work and train uh, to improve their skills moving forward, even if their primary function was not necessarily in a digital or web capacity. Um, so I thought that it was very interesting uh, in the report talking about how everybody is going to have to start promoting um, the the content that is created through the New York Times. And I think that that's very similar for us, whether we are working in um, development 
per se and we're trying to communicate a case for support, being able to do that in a strategic manner in a digital fashion, whether that be through our own personal social media channels or through um, cultivating pieces of information that we can then share with a digital team to push out, uh, having that certain mindset is critical. Um, and the same thing can be said for alumni relations and relationship building. Ultimately, at the end of the day, what advancement is about is building relationships and communicating with our alumni and constituents. And so really, we're thinking about putting that on a different platform and putting that platform first then I think everybody in the advancement team needs to be at least have some sort of baseline competency in digital communication. I absolutely agree and as you were speaking it occurred to me that the relationship building point is absolutely bang on target and, and there have been lots of people who have spoken very intelligently to that ranging from, from Keith Hannon to Andy Shanlin. Mm -hmm. um, so I agree that there's a certain baseline skill set that's necessary to be able to do that in a convincing way. But the flip side of that coin is that the people who those people report to have to understand that doing that effectively takes time. Right. And in a world in which you're being held accountable for your performance and, and metrics and so on and so forth, um, it occurs to me that you could actually build mm -hmm. into the job description a certain amount of time. For that's allocated to building those relationships and maintaining your your social presence in such a way that when you share, there are actually people out there who are listening to you. Mayan, what's your take on this? I agree with everything that was just said, um, especially the how do you express the importance and value of doing this that everyone needs to do it to people above you that might not be expressly doing it themselves, but are managing the people who would be doing it. Um, I so I think that yes, there are there are uh, things that we need to be looking for in terms of what like digital skills new hires are going to do. But I also think that there's a role that's missing, which is basically someone whose job it is to be both on top of everything that's happening and educating everyone from I just started to I've been here for 25 years, and that is. I don't know who that person is, but it's got a lot of trust and a lot of like willingness to learn and translate new ideas and technology to a specific organization. Um, and I don't know where that fits. Like that's something I've been thinking about a lot recently in terms of every time someone new starts working in Oberlin and turns to me and says, we're, we're, we're doing the Facebook page thing, can you help? It's like two or three questions before where we actually need to start. So I then put on the educator hat, back up, start talking about what it is that they're trying to do, try and figure out if social media is a part of it, then talk about what kinds of social media, if it's actually the direction they want to go. Everyone in our office is semi-capable of doing that with a little bit more of a bent toward their area of expertise, but there's no single person in our office who just like directs traffic but also hands over the educational resource to make sure that the person that we're speaking with around campus knows what's going on and understands the importance of it importance of it within their scope. So yes to everything else, but also there almost needs to be a role that is, maybe it's human resources and like a completely alternative universe um, that has this happen because it's if it's everyone's responsibility, everyone needs to have somebody to turn to and it's not just the social media manager of the development office. Oh, I could not agree with you more on that front. Adam, what's your take? Yeah, so I love love those comments. I'll take it maybe even a little, little slightly different direction. Um, I, I almost wonder if we'll we'll be sort of less focused on looking even what at what someone says on a resume, right? It's going to shift to a world where it's much more about sort of the you know show don't tell, like what what projects have you worked on lately? What what ways have you demonstrated these skills? Which is, is kind of interesting. So I think the resume is going to is going to be less important, but it is that sort of, um, you know, in the web development world, it's sort of like, okay, show us three recent websites, apps, something that you've built, you know, that's that's much more, that gets us a lot farther than saying listing out the skills or listing, so I almost wonder what the digital equivalent of that is across social, across all of these these worlds, um, and I think what it's, it's going to lead to some cool things, right, it's going to let us see 
the real work product um, much more easily than some of the clever interview questions that try to get at it from different angles, right? But it also, um, I think, could open up the door to people. I was just thinking back to the, the report again in the New York Times. You know, someone who's been a wonderful print journalist for years really could reinvent themselves by kind of diving in head first to this stuff, collaborating on some projects, building, you know, getting their hands dirty and have a totally different new career tra trajectory because of that. So the other thing is, as we think about our organizations changing, it isn't necessarily about bringing in the young, replacing, you know, the folks who have been here for a while at all. It's about um, who has that kind of interest and um, wants to kind of dive into some of these new things. And I think in the future, people are going to be even less limited by the long resume that they've had, right? It's going to be those last three cool things that you built or did or collaborated on. And the thing that I really love about digital is that, I mean, people often say that what you do online never goes away, which is absolutely true, and that's a problem if you've been doing things that are going to hurt you. Uh, but there can also be an incredible archive of fantastic work that you've done in a whole range of contexts that is visible. And, you know, I, I very strongly believe that hiring managers ought to be Googling the heck out of people who they're considering bringing in for an interview mm -hmm. to see if, if they can identify that, that, uh, that sort of history of, of work and performance. Um, and I just, I don't know. That, and it's interesting, right, because that's something that it's hard to... It's hard to make up lost ground. If you haven't been doing that all along, there's a definite competitive advantage to people who've just been living and breathing digital um, from the point that they began to, to have a professional presence out there on the web. Yeah, but yeah I, I really love the idea of, of show, don't tell. Uh, that feels like something that is in a totally appropriate uh, stance to take in a, in a highly visual medium. Um, let's move on now to my final question before we get all blue sky and wrap things up here. Um, and this, I think, relates to some of the points that Mayan was raising there about the missing role. So one of the gaps that the, the report identified was there not being people who were responsible for thinking about the overall evolution of the digital strategy. Um, in the Times context, they recognized that there are a number of people on both the business side and the newsroom side who have the understanding of the digital space and the skills to think about strategy, but of course a newspaper is just about as deadline driven as a, as a fundraising operation is, and those people simply don't have the time to think about how the competitive landscape is evolving in such a way that, that they can begin to try to turn the battleship in one way or the other to position themselves slightly better um, in response to emerging trends. So they very clearly recommend the creation of a small group of people who are officially charged with taking the time to think about how the space is evolving, to um, figure out where there are efficiencies that could be taken advantage of, where there is a uh, need to experiment to see if we can identify or they can identify some way of doing something better or doing something strategic that they weren't able to do before but can do now. What's your thinking about the creation of some sort of a team like that inside of an advancement organization. Let's start with Harmony on that one. It's, I think it's a very interesting question. Um, you know, I think at least in, in our office uh, in advancement at TCU, when needs arise, we tend to create task forces. And those task forces come from across advancement trying to represent, you know, each and every group uh, so that we have people who understand the day-to-day -day operations and the support operations almost in the same way that the New York Times sort of delineates between the journalism group and the business group. Um, and so my first thought was, well, naturally you'd create one of these task forces um, and you would address it. And, but my, my concern with something like that is the sustainability of it. I think when you're talking about thinking about putting digital first, that that is an ongoing conversation um, in a world that is constantly evolving very rapidly. And so um, it probably needs to be something a little bit more permanent um, but you definitely want to have a group of people that was very comfortable with all of the various roles in advancement um, as we are more than simply a fundraising shop. Um, so I, I'm not sure where 
what exactly I think that that would look like at this point if if we were to create something like that. Adam, how does the SAA think about this sort of thing? That's a good question. Um, it's it's something where we have strategic leadership in, in various places, which is, is helpful, um, certainly on campus, by my colleagues in the, the Office of Public Affairs who um, think about Stanford globally uh, in terms of social communications and beyond. We have technology leadership coming from our CIO. We have a certain amount of leadership coming from our team, which we like to be try to be thought leaders and deep in what's going on and be able to share that at a project level and at an organization level. Um, one point I was just going to make is it was interesting in the report that a lot of it did boil down to something that isn't technology at all, which is just the reader experience. And a lot of these, if you think about it, were hiccups as the reader was moving from one platform, be that print, to digital or sort of the continuous experience they're having or the experience they're having over time, let's say, um, with, the, with the paper. So it's just kind of interesting if we think, too, maybe the strategic role or team or task force, whatever that is, might, might be looking just at what is that holistic, for us it would be the alumni experience, for how many maybe the greater constituent or donor experience, for my own maybe the entire um, university, but what is that experience kind of from end to end? Um, I know there are bumps in our experience, you know, from moving from a, st a student to an alum to back to a grad student to an alum who's doing executive education, right? There are a lot of opportunities there to think of the holistic experience. So it would just be interesting to put a, a group of people on that. And almost they just get out their clipboards, you know, and they're, they're you know, go out and, and actually experience what, what our constituents are experiencing and bring that learning and data back to the organization. And there might be some really obvious, oh my gosh moments, you know, or some, some quick wins. So that could be interesting. Totally agree about the importance of actually going out there and, and spending time doing the things that your constituents are doing. Mm -hmm. Because it's possible that there's an experiential gap that's opening up that we're not even aware is there. Right. And unless we have people whose job it is to do that, I mean, that, that gets back to the point about, about just basic market research that, that I made earlier. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think actually focusing seriously on the end user experience, uh, probably if, if there was one single concept that most efficiently addresses the most number of the topics we've talked about today, I think just that simple uh, philosophical shift um, could make a could make a huge impact. Mayan, how does this look from your perch? Um, everything y'all are saying, but more, because from where I sit, it really is about the handoffs and the transitions between how our audience is experiencing us, the university. Um, it's it is easy for me to see task forces or even just like uh, dedicated strategy teams within specific silos but not knowing where that connects to your university as a whole is also a little bit scary to me. So um, when Harmony started talking about uh, problem solving a specific thing, you're problem solving for it right now which is still very much a short-term strategy even if it is a digital strategy team and not just a task force. In my head you have to have someone from admissions and student life in there so you know what to prepare for for and eight years from now. Um, it's really scary to think that way, but it's also in my head very necessary for us to be able to tackle the long term, like the where are we a hundred years from now, where digital is not even digital anymore, but just how life works. Um, so I don't know. I'm 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 intrigued by this strategist con concept most of all, and I want to hold back on that because it's going to be my answer to the last question, but. Um, where it lives and why it exists has um, everything to do with advancement, but almost more to do with where advancement fits into the other things that are happening at the school as well. Good answer. And that also teed up my final question, um, which is where we're going to have a little fun and get very blue sky. So we've spent the bulk of this past hour talking about what a digital first stance might look like in a range of areas across advancement. Um, but to wrap up, I would like to ask each of today's guests to um, speculate about how all of this actually adds up. Um, what is the potential payoff for an advancement shop of making this transition to a digital first stance, either from the perspective of the institution or its constituents or both? Um, and what I'm really trying to get out here is a sense of what's the reward 
what's the light at the end of the tunnel that would make this sort of a, a difficult, uncomfortable, disruptive exercise in, in introspection and repositioning uh, worthwhile. Adam, do you want to tackle that first? Sure, sure, and, and maybe I can do it succinctly. I can um, tie it back to where I started. For us, it really boils down to a relevant experience by segment for all segments, right? So we, the Alumni Association, fulfill our mission, reach, serve, and engage all alumni. We'll do it in very different ways by behavior, by interest, by attribute, and, and the intersection of the three of those across our segments. But at the end of the day, we are engaging everybody in the way that they want to be engaged with the institution. We're evolving with them through their lives. We're evolving through the generations as the generations change. Um, and we fulfill our mission. That's it for us. Harmony, how about you? Yeah, I, I think um, just building off what Adam said, basically, it will help us to uh, remain relevant. Uh, as I said, you know, our, uh, our alumni base is getting younger and younger. Um, as Mayan has pointed out uh, a couple of times, you know, the, there are people in middle school and high school using platforms that we haven't even started thinking about getting into the realm of yet, and those are our future alumni 20, 25 years down the road. So we need to be paying attention to them and staying relevant and making sure that we get up to speed in the digital and social environments now ensures that we can be flexible and adapt to whatever comes on down the road. Mayan, you get the last word. Okay, so my big, my blue sky thing is actually like a concept that I've been working on myself for a little while, but after reading the report and kind of in the, the lens of this conversation have shifted a little bit. Um, having essentially, so the way that it's described in the report is having a digital strategy team for the New York Times, the whole of the New York Times. And I see that being the blue sky for each of our institutions where there's a strategy team for the institution and like even something as simple as this like office, department, whatever, kind of works together um, for part of the day, but then each has its own beats or segments or whatever you'd like to call them, where you essentially embed yourself as a strategist for the day. Um, it will get more of the big thinking down on the ground, but also the day-to-day -day stuff back into the big thinking. If there are pain points, you can start to find them. If there are really awesome successes, you can know about them as they're happening. Um, and what that looks like, I, I don't really know. That's an office that doesn't exist. That's 10 years from now, 20 years from now, something. Um, but I love the idea of it in terms of um, all of us know our departments the best because we're working within them, but we don't necessarily know how the other things around, all the other moving pieces of the university kind of fit together with that. Um, I'm in the weird position of working at a school that I went to where I also am a donor, where I'm also a, like all of the different, I'm like six of the eight audiences that I'm trying to reach at any given time. Um, and that's really complicated because how, how do you do that? Because uh, like not everything hits me right and I'm doing it for way more people than just myself. So um, it's, I guess, an awareness that we're dealing with people who are very finicky and we're also people who are going to be learning from this process the whole way through. I love that idea. Um, I'd actually be willing to bet that we're going to start seeing stuff like that probably within five years, um, mainly because I, I feel like so much of the conversation about digital and higher ed has thus far dealt with things like MOOCs and marketing communications, and a lot of these areas that, while they're, they're very complicated, are also reasonably obvious. And I actually, I, I think that, that over time we're going to realize that the impact of digital on higher ed is far greater than it appears even now with all of the uh, sort of chicken little, oh my god, the sky is falling um, mm -hmm. hysteria that it's produced at times. And the only way I can think organizationally for an actual institution to grapple with that as a whole is something similar to what you've just described. Um, so I'm, I'm brokenhearted to say that we have come to the end of our hour and have actually uh, run just over. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, Adam, Harmony, Mayan, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. Um, but sadly, it is time to go. Uh, my co-host, Ryan Catherwood, will be back here in two weeks with another great show. And once again, thank you so much to our sponsors, iModules and M Stoner.
As always, you can watch more shows from Advancement Pros on the Advancement Live archive located at higheredlive.com. Thank you to everyone who tuned in live, and see you next time. Thanks.